Vibra Walters is live and obviously unedited and will cover a wide range of subjects. Mr. Nixon is not being paid for this interview and he has no control over the questions. We thought that a proper location and time for this event would be here in a special edition of 2020. It's been nearly six years since Richard Nixon resigned as president. He is 67 years old now and lives in New York. Mr. Nixon dealt extensively with his presidency and with Watergate in his memoirs and in six and a half hours of syndicated television discussions with David Frost three years ago. But he is perhaps ironically re-emerging today in the eyes of some as a foreign policy expert, especially in Europe. Mr. Nixon has written a book called The Real War. And he says in this book that we are already in World War III, not a shooting war, but a battle between the United States and the Soviet Union to stop Russia from securing vital oil and minerals. Mr. Nixon says in this book that unless we have the will to become stronger strategically and militarily, that this is a war we will lose. And now the interview. Mr. Nixon, I would like to use what uh, Hugh said about your book as a jumping off point. You write of our lack of will and uh, leadership, but this lack of will is directly traceable to Watergate and Vietnam, both under your administration. Now, Watergate will be debated, uh, Vietnam will be debated for many years to come, but Watergate, Mr. Nixon, was you. When you see how Americans today distrust their leaders, when you see cynicism instead of hope, and instead of will, don't you feel responsible? Well, I certainly feel responsible for some of the developments that have occurred. Uh, for example, for what has happened to the CIA, which was an overreaction to Watergate. Uh, what has happened with regard to uh, limiting the power of the President, the War Powers Act, which was an overreaction to Watergate. Uh, however, I would suggest this, that at this point, there isn't any question in my mind uh, but that the country is coming out of what I call the Watergate syndrome. Uh, the American people are a strong people, and the American people are ahead of their leaders today. Uh, the American people want this country to be strong. Uh, they don't like to see the United States uh, held in disrespect around the world. Uh, they don't like to see it weak. And I think under the circumstances that uh, with Watergate now six years past, uh, we're at a time when it is time to move forward to the future and not dwell on the past. Well, let us talk about uh, perhaps what we might call some uh, what if you were president questions. You're critical of our not standing up to the Soviet Union, but Mr. Nixon, as president, you aggressively pursued detente with the Soviet Union. Now today you say it's not enough, that what we need also is containment. But the big question is where do we contain the Russians? Where do we say that's it, no more, and perhaps even confront them militarily? Well, let us just understand uh, when I talk about containment uh, that I not only practice the taunt with containment, uh, but that I would insist today that the reason that the taunt is not working is that we have not had containment. Uh, it's rather interesting to note that just six years ago tonight, May 8, 1972, uh, I made a speech to the nation on television, carried on ABC and the other networks. And in that speech, I uh, announced that we were going to bomb and mine uh, Haiphong and Hanoi. That was two weeks before the Soviet summit. I did that because unless that decision had been made, I would have been going to Moscow at a time that Soviet tanks operated by the North Vietnamese would have been running through the streets of Saigon. People said that the Soviet would not go to the summit in the event that we did it. It did not happen that way. Because we stood up to them, we were able to sit down with them. And that is the way they taught a work. OK, but where now? Look at recent history. Where would that tripwire have been? Angola, Ethiopia? Oh, let, let's get closer. Uh, what would you have done when the Soviet Union uh, invaded Afghanistan that was not done? Well, you said, where do you start? Uh, I would have started with Angola. And then uh, President Ford tried to start with Angola. I would have conditioned at that point, first I would have conditioned further relations with the Soviet, the things that they want, uh, further negotiations on arms control, trade, and et cetera, on their ceasing their 
uh, support of Castro sending troops into Angola. Uh, and second, and if I didn't? would say if, if they didn't, under the circumstances, then I would have supported, uh, which of course, as you remember, uh, an attempt was made to get the Congress to support, uh, I would have supported those forces in Angola who were opposed to the Soviet forces. We failed to do that. And incidentally, I may say that some conservative Republicans and conservative Democrats went along with that failure to their discredit, in my Would opinion. Would you have sent American forces? It would not have been necessary. Mm -hmm. We had the forces. And as a matter of fact, right now, uh, Mr. Svambibi has been over here in the United States, and he should be supported uh, against the Angolan forces there, the Let Soviet government. In other words, it isn't right to have them have a happy hunting ground here uh, in the free world without our trying to stop them there. Okay, let's go closer. Afghanistan. The Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. What would you have done then, and what would you do now? They're in there. Well, first of all, 18 months before they invaded Afghanistan, they had a coup d'etat which gave them control of Afghanistan. They should have been stood up to then, and then we should have conditioned our further discussion of arms control, which they wanted, on that particular... Well, you keep talking about standing up to. Let's take it right now. How do we stand up to them now? How do we get them out of there now? Well, the way we get them out now, first, is to recognize that we don't have many options due to the fact that we didn't stand up earlier. I think that the Soviet Union was very surprised when the reaction in the West, and the reaction particularly the United States, was as it was when they went into Afghanistan. Because we had not objected as strongly as we could have objected when they went in 18 months before. The second point is, I think that doing what we have done is correct. We should not be going to, high, to Moscow to high jump with them right after they've mm -hmm. jumped Afghanistan. And then third, I think that it's necessary to recognize that they aren't going to get out of Afghanistan, not now. but. I think we then change the dialogue, and we change it in this way. We say to them that not only do we not accept they're going into Afghanistan with the Red Army, but that further negotiations on things that they want, arms control, trade, and et cetera, will be conditioned on their stopping their support of Castro's forces in Angola, in Ethiopia, and in Yemen. I think, in other words, we should lay it right on the line to them. And I would hope that when Senator Muskie, now Secretary of State Muskie, meets uh, with his opposite number, Mr. Gromyko, he will lay it on the line and say, we disapprove of Afghanistan, we believe you should get out of there, but let's start with where they have, uh, were in okay. before in those three countries. And we will do what? I mean, we already have said that we're not going to send them technological supplies, we're not going to send them grain, we're not going to have the Olympics. What else? I've just indicated what we should do. I think one of the biggest mistakes of the present administration has been that when they have made these moves, when they went into okay. Ethiopia, when they went into Yemen, when they went into Afghanistan, to go right ahead with arms control negotiations and that sort of thing. Now they have stopped, and I give them credit for that. Last week in an interview in Europe, you said, this was just before the Iranian rescue mission, that President Carter should, and I quote, stop giving warnings and take action. And he did, and things, if anything, are worse. What would you do now? You're talking about Iran? I'm talking about Iran. Well, as far as warnings are concerned, I think that it's time to have a moratorium on it. I don't think that it does, I don't think it does any good at the present time to indicate that we're going to take military action when the military options are obviously very, very few. Okay, but we took military action. It was a failed rescue mission. What would you suggest the president do now? I suggest, first of all, that he recognized that as far as the rescue operation is concerned, that while we should not rule it out, and we should not rule out using military force, mm -hmm. we should quit talking about it because it's an empty cannon at this time. Second, that leaves the option first of applying economic sanctions across the board, and I think here our allies now should be willing to go with us, along with us, in doing that. Third, we should go forward, as we must, on the diplomatic track. Now, I don't indicate, I'm not going to suggest that any of these things are going to be successful. It's the least we can do, and at the present time, it's the most we can do. I would say that at the present time, in other words, we've got to try the economic track, we've got to try the diplomatic track, getting our allies, the British, the French, and others, who may have a way that they could be helpful in here Which that we would not doing. be able to help. And then the other thing that I would say is that as we go further into this area, 
that we have to also provide a carrot. Now let's understand one thing. We can never uh, compromise on turning the Shah over to them. We can never compromise on apologizing for what we have done in Iran. However, along with the Japanese, along with the French, along with the Germans, along with the British, I believe that the United States should offer, provided they want to come back into the world community, to help them in the rehabilitation of that country. There are four million unemployed Iranians at the present time. There were none when the Shah left. And I think that that should be the carrot. They should take their choice. They can stay as they are with all of the unemployed that they have and their economic discontent, or they can turn over the hostages and cooperate with us in building a better Iran for the Iranian people. I want to ask you a question about the hostages. There is a major question that confronts not just this country, but all countries today. And that is, if necessary, should a nation be willing to sacrifice the lives of hostages to stand up to terrorism and show it's not a nation that can be humbled? Uh, Israel, for example, does this, treats its hostages as soldiers in war. What is your view? Exactly the same. Uh, I would, Israel's. Exactly. I would, I would regret to say that, uh, particularly with, I'm sure, members of the hostages' families, uh, perhaps listening tonight or maybe reading about it tomorrow, I regret to say this, but I think that one of the major errors that President Carter made at the outset was to indicate that his primary, and in fact it seemed to me his only concern at the beginning, was the lives and safety of the hostages. They are important, but the moment you do that, you are inviting blackmail. They know you'll pay any price in order to save those lives, and we can never do that. Okay, you would have let the Shah of Iran into this country and hostages would have been taken. What at that point, Mr. Nixon, would you have done differently from what President Carter did? When the hostages were taken? Yes. I would not have ruled out the use of force. As a matter of fact, at that early point was the time that it could have been used and used effectively. What? We could have tried a rescue mission at that point because this group that has been set up could have been trained and, and certainly had, had been in operation for a number of years ever since uh, Sante, uh, or we could have moved in some other areas. But it is very, it's very important to bear in mind that the moment that you rule out the use of force, that means that you are giving those who are the militants, uh, in fact, a free hand to do what they want. And the longer that you delay its use, uh, the less it becomes an effective option. The second thing I would have done, I would not have disarmed the army. And by that, this happened, as you recall, after the Shah had left. You remember that after he had left, and then Mr. Heiser, General Heiser, was sent down there, and he was told that the army was not to provide. That was before the Shah left, that General Heiser went. That's that's correct. But the point is that the effect of it was after the Shah had left, because what what happened was the army then was not in a position, once it turned out that those that had succeeded the Shah were the militants that they were, uh, were the international outlaws that they were, the army had been, in effect, been disarmed. I think that was a mistake, and I think that could have avoided this whole thing. Mr. Nixon, America has been criticized for abandoning friends like the Shah, uh, whom you strongly supported, and you've criticized our abandoning him. But isn't the danger just as great in sticking with regimes that have lost the support of their people, like the Shah, like Somoza, like Ian Smith? Again and again, it's it said that we, we back despots and dictators. I couldn't disagree with you more. Uh, what you have to understand is that the choice was never between the Shah and somebody better, but between the Shah and somebody infinitely worse. Well, we don't know and that in the beginning. To, well, the point is, if we didn't know it at the beginning, we'd better know it now. We have friends all over the world like the Shah, and we have friends, for example, in Saudi Arabia at the present time. Uh, because that government happens to be corrupt, it is claimed, are we going to abandon them? Let's take China, for example. Because China is more Stalinist than the Soviet Union, are we going to say that we're going to abandon them? No. But don't we ever say this man is no good for this country, this man is a dictator, this man is a despot, and maybe it could be better, or do we automatically yeah. assume it won't be? We do not automatically assume anything. We have to use our influence and use it effectively, but it's got to be used with a rifle rather than a shotgun, and we must not jump from the frying pan into the fire. Uh, it was a great mistake to do what we did to the Shah, and if that had not happened, we wouldn't have the hostage situation today. If the United States doesn't stand up for its friends, we're not going to have friends. That's true of the Shah, it's true of others as well. The choice is not a good one many times. 
Uh, the choice is between, however, for example, you, when you really equate the Shah with some of the others, I'm really surprised because the choice is between one who is a friend of the United States, whatever may be his failings, and one who is an enemy. One who tries to export his revolution and one who is trying to at least uh, not threaten his, uh, uh, his neighbors. Uh, one who allows, as the Shah did, as you very well know, who allows some human rights who allows some political rights and have, does allow economic rights and another regime that allows none. I would say there's no question about which side I come down on there. And the same is true of Samosa, the same is true of some of the others as well. I don't approve of some of them, but I would say I prefer some rights rather than none, and that's the choice that we have to face up to, or the United States is going to cease to be a great power. I'd love to sit and argue about this with you, and if we have more time in this section, I want to come back to it. But I'm let sure me go would. on, because you mentioned Saudi Arabia. You write in your book, and I quote, The leaders of Saudi Arabia, Oman and Kuwait, must be absolutely reassured that should they be threatened by revolutionary forces internally or externally, we will stand with them and use force if required. Now, my question is, couldn't your advice lead to a superpower confrontation in the part of the world where we cannot win? And this could happen to Saudi Arabia within the next two or three years. And furthermore, do you really think today that our young people would be willing to fight and lose their lives in countries like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Oman? Well, I would suggest this, that what is at stake here is something that our young people, I think, will understand, and the young people of Western Europe, who would also have to participate in this, and I am sure would, and that is that we can lose without fighting at all. Uh, because if, for example, the oil of the Persian Gulf comes under control of a force hostile to Western Europe, hostile to Japan, hostile to the United States, it would mean that they would, in effect, uh, be able to strangle the United States and Western society by having that control. We cannot let that happen. And what we have to do under those circumstances is to commit the force, if necessary, the force that is necessary, to stop forces internal or external that are supported by basically an outside hostile power. That's what would be involved, in my opinion, in Saudi Arabia. And yet, Mr. Nixon, you must be aware of how so many young people do feel. They feel, why not make the sacrifices here so that we are not so dependent upon oil? Why must we die, perhaps, in that part of the world? Beyond that, there are some who feel that we might not even uh, uh, fight in Western Europe. Yes, I understand that, uh, that uh, there are young people uh, who would not, not want to fight any place. I don't want them to fight any place. You don't want them to fight any place. But I do know this, uh, that if young people are, see the facts, if they are led properly uh, in terms of what the stakes are, uh, that our young people, along with the young people of our allies in Western Europe, will stand up in order to save our society. And now that is what is involved here. Uh, now when we talk about uh, the fact that uh, we can just get along without the oil and so forth, uh, can Japan get along without it? Uh, can Western Europe get along without it? Would you I'm not sure. Would you I don't think so. As a matter of fact, I can tell you that if the oil of the Persian Gulf were cut off, it would bring, bring a depression in the United States, Western Europe, Japan, bigger than the depression of the 1930s. And that would bring a dictatorship of the right or left. And I think that can and should be avoided. If I, it, I'm sorry. Yes, you go ahead. Your the, show. Our show. You give the answers. At the uh, opening of the program, I talked about the tripwire. Is Saudi Arabia the tripwire? Is that where you would send the forces? I would say that Saudi Arabia is one of those countries uh, in that part of the world where if it is threatened by internal or external aggression supported by a foreign power, and that would mean the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. or for example, y using South Yemen forces, for example, or Cuban forces, for example, or what have you. If that has happened, I believe then the United States, and I mean the West, has to stand firm and draw the line. Absolutely. All right, that's the tripwire, a tripwire. I'd like to quote from your book, in which you say, if America loses World War III, it will be because of the failure of its leadership class. 
In particular, it will be because of the attention and legitimacy given to the trendies, those over-glamorized dilettantes who mount the fashionable protests and are slobbered over by the news media, whose creation they essentially are. Whatever the latest cause they embrace, whether anti-war, anti-nuclear, anti-military, anti-business, it is almost invariably one that works against the interests of the United States. Mr. Nixon, is there no place, no opportunity for protest? <laughs> well, having been president at a time when uh, we had plenty of protests, I would say there certainly is an opportunity in Washington. Uh, there should be an opportunity, and I'm not objecting to protest. Uh, I am simply suggesting uh, that there has come a time uh, when we have too many of what I call there the trendies, uh, who basically uh, are protesting because of fashion and not because they've thought things through. Uh, now, that's a point of view. You may disagree, but that's anti -war, my Anti-war, anti-nuclear, anti-military, anti-business, trendies, over-glamorized dilettantes who don't understand the issues? Is that what you think they are? Oh, people could be anti-war. They can be anti-nuclear. They can be anti-business. Uh, I mean, they ought to know why. Uh, and s many who are that way jump on any one of those anti-things without knowing why. Uh, and that is what I am really objecting to. Uh, I am suggesting we ought to think things through and have a rational approach to some of these things rather than just getting out and carrying a placard or a sign and shouting slogans. That's what I mean. We're going to pause now, Mr. Nixon. We'll be back shortly. <laughs> When I looked at Datsun 280ZX and Porsche 924, I also looked at this new Mazda RX-7, and that's all it took. Just one look, that's all it took, yeah, just one look, that's all it took. You get a lot of refined sports car with a Mazda RX-7, you also get great mileage, and you get it all at a price that'll really make you look twice. Yeah, the more you look, the more you like. Holiday Inn. Welcome to our people, please, and Hi. Is that the Holiday Inn East, the Holiday Inn West, the Midtown? The one by United Industries. The one by the headquarters or the plant? The headquarters. We offer you a choice of the most popular locations. You need three hands. <laughs> You're right. People, please, and locations. The airport? The one by Holiday Inn North or Holiday Inn South? Is number one <laughs> in people, please, and no, I don't believe they're Blatt's at all. No, Mick Roman didn't believe the Blatt's taste tests until he took one. Blatt's iced. <laughs> this better not be the beer I'm thinking of. Okay, let's see. What is it, Mick? I picked Blatt's over my beer, light beer. What about those Blatt's commercials? Well, I guess it's 100% true. There's no strings on it. I just proved it to myself. Pleased to meet you, Blatt's. <laughs> Introducing Socks and Socks. You don't get whistles when your socks fall down. You won't make points if your feet ache all around. You're not debonair if they rip and tear. So put your best foot forward with Socks and Socks. Socks and stay up wash after wash. Have reinforced heels and toes and a comfortable cotton cushion all over the foot. So put your best foot forward with Socks and New from No Nonsense in food, drug, and other stores. Saturday, live, the semifinals of the Tournament of Champions Tennis. John McEnroe and Vitas Garolidis are among the tennis greats competing for the richest purse in men's tennis history. Then, on a special expanded edition of ABC's Wide World of Sports, live opening day time trials for the Indy 500. Racing for the coveted pole position, defending champ Rick Mears and four-time winner A.J. Voigt are among the expected entrants. Also, the European Weightlifting Championship and the Women's Masters Surfing Championship, Saturday on The Leader, ABC Sports. Mr. Nixon, let's turn our attention to politics in this period. Has the Republican Party recovered from you yet? I think so. Uh, let me say that it's been six years since I left office, uh, and uh, I have not participated in politics since that time, and the Republican Party seems to be very healthy and doing very well, and I don't intend to get in their way. Today is an endorsement of a candidate by Richard Nixon a help or a hindrance? It isn't going to happen, so you don't need to worry about that. 
Have uh, anyone since your resignation asked you to support their candidacy? Anyone who is running? You mean at the national level? Mm -hmm. Well, congressional, whatever level. Oh, yes. For congressional level, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have uh, uh, indicated that I don't intend to participate in politics. Mm -hmm. But you have, I, that is a national level, congressional, but you have been asked to, to endorse. Oh, it, it, for Congress, sure. And the Senate. Uh, and you've said no. Yes. I wondered if we could... Uh, yes, I said no. Yes, you said no. I understand that. I wondered yeah. if at this point we could uh, do something with you that we did with Gerald Ford recently. And that is, I'd like to, to uh, ask you about <laughs> some people and ask you a quick assessment of them. What comes in your mind as I say the names? Jimmy Carter. Very intelligent. Hard worker. Very decent. Uh, excellent campaigner. And unfortunately, a tragedy for him, a tragedy for country, a, uh, an ineffective president. Ronald Reagan. Intelligent, strong, much younger than his uh, years would indicate, and his appearance, vigorous. And uh, in spite of uh, the media, to a certain extent, some of it painting him as being uh, a lightweight uh, and uh, a kook, a very reasonable, responsible man. You have no unfortunately to say about him. You have nothing on the debit side about him. No, he hasn't been president yet. <laughs> George Bush. A uh, very attractive uh, candidate. Uh, admire the way that he's um, hung in there uh, after the shellacking he took in New Hampshire and then in Illinois. Uh, he isn't going to make it, uh, but uh, nobody should try to push him out. And once Reagan is nominated, as he will be at the convention, Bush will be a good party man supporting him. John Anderson. Uh, very intelligent. Uh, uh, suffers a little from what... Uh, some people uh, attribute to Jimmy Carter of, of uh, the arrogance of moral superiority. That would be his weakness. Uh, he, uh, he will start fast. Uh, he will end up with less votes, I think, than George Wallace got. Uh, and uh, will probably hurt each candidate about the same percentage-wise, but probably hurt Carter more because he's going to hurt him in the big states by taking away the liberals. Richard Nixon. I've never judged myself, but since you've asked about politics, perhaps I can tell you about that. Uh, I retired from politics uh, six years ago. Uh, but while I retired from politics, uh, I haven't retired from life. And perhaps I can best characterize myself by saying that uh, while recalling one of the most moving uh, speeches I ever heard, and I think you may have heard it too, uh, in the Congress of the United States when Douglas MacArthur was fired by Harry Truman. And he closed the speech by saying, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. And I would paraphrase that, uh, and this applies to me, that uh, old politicians usually die, but they never fade away. I intend to continue to speak out on occasion when I think it will serve a useful purpose in foreign policy. I do not intend to participate in politics in any way. My political career is over, and so we'll now go to other questions. I realize that I left well, you can one... ask political That's questions all. you want. Well, I realize Your show. This, uh, I realize in this I left one name out, and that is Edward Kennedy. Uh, suffers from comparison with uh, both of his brothers, and particularly with Jack Kennedy. Uh, he's, I think his greatest weakness is, is not Chappaquiddick, although that, of course, has hurt him. But his greatest weakness, curiously enough, is where Jack Kennedy was strong, and I should know, television. Uh, Jack Kennedy had a cool personality on television. And Teddy Kennedy, who is, uh, some people tell me, better looking than Jack, 
uh, was, uh, who comes over quite well when he's speaking to a rally, comes through very hot and rasping on television. I think that is one of the things that uh, makes him weaker. In 1972, you wrote in your diary, the country simply can't afford the likes of Ted Kennedy, and you added George McGovern, as even a possible presidential candidate in the future. You still feel that way? Well, certainly about uh, George McGovern, and no. yet, mm -hmm. and, and as between Carter and uh, Kennedy, and uh, I'd say I don't want this to hurt Carter, uh, but I would strongly favor Carter if I were a Democrat. Uh, now, incidentally, may I say, in, 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 in fairness to Ted Kennedy, I admire his uh, political guts, too. He's hanging in there. Uh, he's down, but he's not out. Bush is out. Uh, but if Kennedy were to win California, and I don't think it's likely that he will, but if he were to win it, then I think you're going to find a lot of politicians taking a hard look, as Governor Kerry has, as to whether or not they can nominate or should nominate somebody who can't carry New York, California, Pennsylvania, or Michigan. Do you think that could happen? You think George Bush should, should get out now? No, no. I, if I thought it, I wouldn't say it. I, I don't believe that party people should urge him to lean on him. He'll make up his mind in his own good time. Uh, he's got to stay in. He's got a million dollars left. He'll put on a good fight in California. And uh, after that, I think he will support Reagan. Mr. Nixon, should Jimmy Carter have gone to Tito's funeral in Yugoslavia? That's what we've been hearing about the last two days, a controversy over that. What do you think? I would have gone. Uh, I respect his decision and the reasons for it, however. Uh, I think the White House indicated that if president can't go to all the funerals, and of course he can't. Uh, I, however, as you may recall, did go to de Gaulle's funeral. Uh, I went to de Gaulle's funeral because I thought it was so important to uh, continue the rehabilitation of the relations between the U.S. and France, which had begun uh, when I visited France right after my election in 1969. Uh, I didn't go to any other funerals. I think in the case of Tito, the reason that Carter should have gone is not so that he could meet with uh, all these other prime ministers, presidents, and so forth. Uh, he, could, he can find other times to do that. He can communicate in other ways. But because I think it would be a very firm signal to the Soviet, don't mess around with Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. to have Carter there with the Europeans and the Chinese and the rest saying, don't mess around with Yugoslavia. Particularly after what happened in Afghanistan, the Soviet has to know we draw the line in Yugoslavia, and we draw the line on Saudi Arabia and a few of these other places. Mr. Nixon will be back with more in just a moment. Where can you get the sexy car with great gas mileage? At the sign of the cat. The 1980 Mercury Capri. Higher gas mileage ratings than six different Datsuns and Toyotas. And right now, save as much as 50% on a specially priced option package for even more Capri value. Great mileage, great value, and that sexy Capri magic. Now that's something to be proud of. See your Lincoln Mercury dealer, his pride is shining through. Sorry about that, Chief. Yes, Maxwell Smart. Agent 86 is back. The enemy has a new secret weapon which will expose the entire world. Maxwell Smart is confident. And there never will be a new bomb. Maxwell Smart is resourceful. Maxwell Smart is alert. Don Adams is Maxwell Smart in his first movie, The Nude Bomb. Rated PG starts Friday at a theater near you. It's time for Erlanger. One look, one sip, one taste will tell you. This beer is a classic. 
Here's to our new neighbor. <laughs> Come and taste the moment burning there. Barbara Walters continues her interview with former President Richard Nixon when 2020 continues in a moment. This is 24 News Brief with Paul Ray. Good evening. Those 23 BGSU students arrested last night during a protest are the subject of another demonstration this evening. And we'll have a report on the visit to this area by the ERA activist who was excommunicated from the Mormon Church. In sports, Jim Tish will have highlights of tonight's uh, NHL playoff game. And in the weather, Dave Carlson says it'll be unseasonably cool again tonight. Rosemary Collins and I will have those stories and more at 11 on 24 Eyewitness News. Lakeport VW Hill & Burn brings you the elegant 1980 Dasher, where luxury and practicality find a happy meeting ground. This Dasher diesel is the number two fuel economy car in America and offers superior quantity and excellent handling. You should test drive the VW Dasher at Lakeport VW, where you have the choice of two-door, four-door, and station wagon models, where you will find Lakeport's award-winning service department. Lakeport VW Hill & Burn, dedicated to excellence. You tell people the movies are a magic carpet ride. So let's get on it. You know, the first minute I saw you, I knew it'd be like this. Don't miss the Dream Merchants on TV 24. <laughs> TV 24, WDHO, Toledo. You didn't pay enough. <laughs> Mr. Nixon, we touched on some aspects of your personal life. I'd like to spend this period in discussing it just a bit more. I talked today with one of the men who had worked for you and had gone to jail as a result of Watergate. And I asked him, if he could ask you one question, what would it be? And this was it. He said that many men went to jail as a result of Watergate, and you did not. He asked if you feel any responsibility for these men today, and although he had never heard from you himself, have you contacted any of the others to express your concern? Well, I've contacted, uh, I think, a considerable number of those who uh, uh, had to go to prison because of the Watergate thing and uh, I must say that I feel a, a very deep responsibility to them uh, I have I knew their families I was concerned about them and uh, I uh, what specific ones would you like to know about well the man who uh, gave me this question was John Ehrlichman I haven't contacted Ehrlichman uh, I have felt that he probably would not really appreciate being contacted. But, for example, Haldeman, uh, Mitchell, uh, Chapin, Kambach. You've <laughs> I been think in touch most, with all of them. Oh, yes, sure. I've seen them all, yes. And I, I correspond with them regularly, sure. There are people, Mr. Nixon, who resent the fact that we are giving you airtime tonight because they feel that while holding the highest office of the land, you let them down terribly. They resent the fact that after all of this, you have enough personal money to buy a three-quarter of a million dollar townhouse, that you have a 16-room office that rents for $66,000 a year. I'm sure you've read all of this in the paper and people have talked about this, as well as secret servicemen paid for by the taxpayers, and that you also have a pension of $66,000 a year just from the presidency, and all this makes them angry. How do you answer these people, Mr. Nixon? I can understand their anger. That's it? Yes, that's the answer. Do you feel that you have anything to apologize for? No, for what I have earned? Not at all. No, I've, uh, I must say that uh, uh, as far as what I own at the present time, I uh, worked hard for it. Uh, I did very well on my book, my first one, um, and from that I was able, of course, to uh, make payments on my house. I sold my house in California for a good profit. I sold my house in Florida for a good profit. Uh, I put that into my place in New York, uh, but everything I have I've earned. Nobody has given me anything. I haven't inherited anything. No, I'm not a bit ashamed of that. What else is your question? 
I wonder how people react to you when they see you on the streets now that you've moved to New York. Do you feel this anger? Are people, do they ignore you? Do they come up and say, how are things? What is it like for you? Well, they're very friendly. I mean, you know, New York's that kind of a town. Any town that'll support the Mets is always for an underdog. So you feel good about being here? Oh, yes. Recently, in a just published book, Spiro Agnew wrote that he was afraid of an assassination attempt against him emanating from the White House. And G. Gordon Liddy has written that he felt that he should kill columnist Jack Anderson at that time, not today, but then. Now, are both of these men crazy? Or what is there about you and your administration that allowed these two men to think that such things could happen? Well, these two men have both suffered a great deal. Uh, Liddy has spent several years in jail. And uh, Spiro Agnew uh, has resigned the vice presidency and uh, has uh, had a, what, what appeared to be a brilliant career, uh, political future ruined. And I can understand how they would feel very bitter about that. No, they don't say this now. They say this is the way they felt then. That, that G. Gordon Liddy then felt at the time that he should kill Jack Anderson because he was an enemy of, of, of yours and an enemy of what you were trying to do. And Spiro Agnew says that the reason that he resigned, what he specifically says is that uh, he felt that General Haig was threatening him with an assassination threat. And, and what one wonders is what, what is there that allowed these men at that time, under your administration, to think that such things were possible? Well, I would suggest that uh, they are now writing in retrospect. Uh, certainly as far as uh, Spiro Agnew is concerned, uh, when I talked to him before he left, uh, he didn't express anything of that sort to me. Uh, I think he would have. No, he thought about that. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, let me say this. Uh, Spiro Agnew has suffered a great deal. He served, in my opinion, uh, very admirably as vice president. None of the things for which he resigned occurred uh, when he was vice president, as you know. It was while he was governor. No, before. some of the accusations were oh, about oh, vice president. Oh, yes, but the accusations are one thing, and what was proved was something else. Uh, the accusations, if I may say, I, I would say, had to do with, uh, with for example, uh, with the GSA and that sort of thing, but I know this case very well. What was involved w with, with the kickbacks uh, while he was governor of Maryland? I've just finished reading the book, and I, I really don't mm -hmm. want to do the whole interview about Spiro Agnew. However, it was also about kickbacks, about money that he took while in the White House, and this was part of the 40-page exposition oh, of evidence that was put in when oh, he I had to resign. I understand. Some of the money was paid after he was in the White House, but the money was not for anything he had done. But it was paid for him in president. the White House. That's my he took point. took money in the White my House. My point is, as far as the act was concerned, it was not for anything he'd done. As vice president, he served honorably, he served well. And... Uh, I, um, I regret that he feels this way. It, of course, is not true. As far as Gordon Liddy is concerned, uh, how he got this impression, I wouldn't know. I, I do know that uh, he uh, was one who was, from um, all reports, uh, had had a very fine career with the FBI. Uh, as a matter of fact, my, I don't believe I ever met him. Uh, I might have in a group. But my main recollection of him, he wrote a very long memorandum about J. Edgar Hoover. He felt that Hoover had served too long and felt that he should resign. Uh, that's my recollection of Liddy. But otherwise, I, I would not know. You know, Mr. Nixon, again and again, when people have written books about you, people who worked for you, people who were close to you in one way or another, they say that you are cold, remote, and that they were unable to reach you. Why do you think this is? Or do you think this is an apt description? Why are you inter interviewing me then? Why am I interviewing? Yeah. No, I'm not. Ta I'm not talking about. I don't know you very well. I'm not talking about whether I find you cold or not. I'm talking about even people like like uh, Henry Kissinger, who knows you very mm -hmm. well. Talk about this remoteness, this mm -hmm. inability to reach you. I like Henry very much. <laughs> Let us go on. In those days. Why don't we get serious? Well, because I think people are still, I am serious, people are interested in you, people are still serious. trying to understand you, I'm sorry you find it, <laughs> that you find uh, these questions unserious. Uh, <laughs> we have a different idea, perhaps, of what serious is, but let me go oh, on. no, I'm not objecting to the questions, you know. I'm very serious. Not at all. 
In those early days after Watergate, I don't know whether you'll find this serious, but I'm serious about it. Were there times when you, when you thought you might go under emotionally? Not at all. You always felt that you were able to handle it? There were not times no. when it was just physically, overwhelming? Physically, I came pretty close to going under, as you may recall. I had this phlebitis in the operation, and uh, I was a bleeder, and uh, it was pretty close. And I thought then I probably wasn't going to make it. There was one morning. But uh, emotionally, never. It's just part of my makeup. That perhaps gets back to the question I was asking earlier. I think a great many people today would like to know how Mrs. Nixon is. Well, if you saw her, and uh, of course how women looks very important, you would never know she had a stroke. I just saw her before I came down here, and she's watching the program now. And uh, she's probably getting stirred up a bit, but uh, she'll be watching it. Uh, she doesn't have the stamina that she had. She didn't go to Europe with me because it's just too hard for her. Uh, she doesn't go out socially, or we do. We go out to the restaurants now and then, that sort of thing. But, and thank God for this, we don't have to go to dinners anymore, or cocktail parties and so forth, because frankly, we, neither of us cared much for that anyway. Mm -hmm. And having done the top, we don't want to do any others. But there's one thing I think perhaps describes her better than anything else. I, I recall when I was in China, just uh, my third trip, uh, right after Labor Day of last year, and I had a marvelous Chinese interpreter who was with her interpreter, uh, was her interpreter, I should say, back in 1972, the visit where you were with us. You know, in fact, you were with us so much that somebody wondered if you weren't uh, part of the party. <laughs> but any event, uh, and I was only with you on that one trip. I know, but you, you, it, was, it was delightful. I thought it was great, but uh, we got a lot of good comments on that afterwards. And then, but she, she this interpreter you may remember was, mis, uh, was a woman mm -hmm. with Mrs. Nixon. In. And then with her also in 76, we went back after the resignation. She did not go this last time because she's had the stroke, she's had pneumonia and the rest and couldn't make it this fall. But this interpreter was my interpreter this time. We were riding in a train up to Peking, and usually the communist interpreters are very proper, but she asked about Mrs. Nixon the question, and then she said something. I admire her very much. She's a very strong woman. That says it all. She's a very strong woman. Why don't we return in the time that we have left to some further questions about foreign affairs. As, since this is a live program, we've tried to get to as many as we can in different areas, and we will go back to some of the foreign affairs questions. Today, you have advocated spending uh, $30 billion a year for the next five years on increase in the military. And yet, just last week in Congress, we saw that they would not even raise the budget at that point, the military budget. You have talked, and you talked about in Europe, how you felt that uh, this country was ready to support a stronger stand. But when you see what Congress is doing, where do you see that support? I would say that this election campaign is going to bring it out. Uh, I believe that both the candidates, uh, President Carter, assuming that uh, Senator Kennedy doesn't pull an upset, and uh, Governor Reagan, uh, will be campaigning uh, for a stronger defense. Uh, and I believe that whoever is the next president, be it Carter or Reagan, will have a mandate for spending what is necessary on defense. It's really a question of whether we have too much or too little. Now, if we have too much money for defense, it's going to cost us money. If, on the other hand, we have too little, it will cost us our lives or our freedom or both. So we should have, in my view, too much rather than too little. And I believe the country will support it. While you See, that, that mm -hmm. $30 billion I pointed out would be only 1% of the whole GNP. Now, 1% of the GNP, I think, is very, very modest insurance for our lives and freedom. And you, you think this mandate that's going to come in the election is going to affect Congress as well and that you will have that increase? I do. But what about the argument that during your administration, the military budget was cut? I think something like, I don't have the figures in front of me, they were either cut 9% to 5%, and then it can be argued that the weakness in the military defense now is traceable to your administration. Well, let us uh, 
bear in mind what happened during that administration. You may remember that there were 550,000 men in Vietnam when I came into office. Uh, when I left, there were none. Uh, and that, of course, met a very, very substantial reduction in the defense budget. The cost of that war was completely gone as far as personnel was concerned. Uh, the second point that we should have in mind is that during the period that I was in office, uh, the five years, I submitted budgets to the Congress for military spending. They cut those budgets by $35 billion. Same problem we're having today. Yeah, the same problem we're having today. The other point that I should make as far as those programs are concerned uh, that we had in that Congress, and uh, primarily a Democratic Congress, as you know. Of course, President Carter has a Democratic Congress, but he isn't able to get it of his own party. He's un not able to get them to do what he wants. But in that Congress, we got ABM through by only one vote. We got Trident Submarine through only by one vote. There were 40 senators, believe it or not, who voted against all MERV testing, which would have put us at a terrible disadvantage with the Soviet Union. The Mansfield Amendments, which would have brought 150,000 home from Europe, uh, barely missed passing. So it was a very difficult time to keep the budget up. Let me say, I have no apology at all for our defense record. We tried to get more. The Congress wouldn't provide it. But the country's in a different mood now. The war in Vietnam is over. Uh, the Watergate syndrome is far behind us. And I believe the country at the present time is ahead of the leaders. And if the leaders ask for more, they can get more and they'll support him. When we were talking earlier about the Shah, there has been uh, some criticism. There have been some who have said that you helped bring about the downfall of the Shah by allowing him to buy unlimited arms, uh, by contributing to his megalomania, by disrupting the economy. Uh, these have been recent reports. I'm sure you have heard them. How do you answer that? Well, I would say first, that the Shah was a very valuable ally to us. Uh, he kept the peace through that whole area. If the Shah had been in power, I do not think the Soviet Union would have moved into Afghanistan. Uh, the second thing I would, have, would say is that you must remember that we owe a great deal to the Shah for the outcome of the 73 war. He was the only one that allowed, allowed overflight, you may, re may remember, yes, of our planes. And he was the one that furnished the oil for the 7th Fleet when nobody else, I mean, for the 6th Fleet when nobody else would do it. Uh, I would say that under those circumstances, it was worth having the Shah as a friend and as a friend who had the military power to keep that area uh, from coming under hostile forces, which he did during the period he was there. Now that he's gone, somebody has to fill that vacuum, and who's going to do it? We have just another moment or two left. I'd like, in concluding, to ask you how you think history will regard you and how you hope it will regard you? Well, I cannot judge how history will regard me. Uh, I would hope it would uh, uh, hold me accountable for the mistakes that I have made. It should. Uh, I would hope and perhaps expect uh, that it would also remember that during my administration, uh, we ended a war which we had inherited and entered it in an honorable way, uh, that we opened a relationship with the People's Republic of China, which was essential for their good, for our good, and absolutely indispensable if we're going to have peace and freedom in the world uh, existing in the 21st century. Not that there is freedom in the People's Republic of China, but if they were on the other side now, Believe me, I wouldn't be writing this book. We would have already lost the war. In just a few seconds we have left now, and there's almost just time for a yes or no. Are you sorry you didn't burn the tapes? You know, interestingly enough, everybody in Europe that I talked to said, why didn't you burn mm. the tapes? And the answer is, I probably should have. But mainly, I shouldn't have even installed them because Johnson or system was there. I had it taken out. And I shouldn't have ever put them in the but first place. if you place. had it to do all over again, you'd burn them? Yes, I think so, because they were private conversations subject to misinterpretation, as we have well seen. Thank you for being with us, Mr. Nixon.
Lemon tree, it's from Lipton, got that fresh squeezed lemon taste. Come on, try lemon tree. Lemon tree, it's from Lipton, got that fresh squeezed lemon taste. From the juice of real lemon, lemon tree's got fresh squeezed taste. Lemon tree, the lemonade flavored drink mix from Lipton. Fresh squeezed taste with no artificial flavor. Thanks, Mom. Lemon tree, it's from Lipton, got that fresh squeezed lemon taste. Get fresh squeezed taste with lemon tree. Some people think Japanese Grand Touring Cars, like this Toyota Sarika GT Liftback Automatic, get good gas mileage at a good price. But according to the fuel economy sticker your government requires on every new car sold in America, this Pontiac Grand Prix with V6 offers the same estimated gas mileage. And according to this sticker, the V6 Pontiac Grand Prix's price $298 plus. What does Pontiac know that we don't? Give mom a Kenmore and save. Save $50 on this Kenmore microwave oven. With touch controls to cook by time. Or by temperature. And save $50 on this Kenmore sewing machine. With convertible free arm, five utility stitches, five stretch stitches, and built-in button holder. Give mom a Kenmore. On sale now at Sears. Kenmore. Solid as Sears. Bag. Yeah, Maggie's so special, I feed her Top Choice. My dry's nutritious. So's Top Choice, and it's got high-quality protein. So? That leading dry doesn't. Oh. Besides, Maggie's got something Butch will never have. Puppies everywhere. Yep, and they get Puppy Choice. Nutritious Top Choice and Puppy Choice dog foods. The family with high-quality protein. <laughs> Friday. That's my mom. Rona Barrett visits with stars and their mothers to find out their side of fame. I don't see her as a sex symbol. I see her as my daughter. Then on the Friday night movie... The whole world is full of people trying to meet one another. They were all looking for love and ready to try anything to get it. You know that video dating place I was telling you about? It's mix and match romances until they find their perfect partners on the love tapes. Tomorrow on ABC. Monday, public television plans to air a broadcast, a docudrama, about the execution of a Saudi Arabian princess for adultery. The Saudis, the U.S. State Department, and two major oil companies don't want the film on the air. Tonight on ABC News Nightline, the full story, Death of a Princess, 11.30, 10.30 Central. That is 2020 for tonight. I'm Hugh Downs. We're in touch, so you be in touch. Good night. has been the ABC News Magazine 2020.